July of 1969 saw the release of July of 1969. <clears throat> the albums. It's almost done, honest. <music> Greetings, one and all, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Yes, the end of July is fast approaching, so it is time yet again for Backtracks, my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, as well as at least one Spotlight album. And yes, again this month I've got two Spotlight albums. Uh, there are, I don't think there's been a month uh, in 2019 so far that I've had fewer than two, so of course now that I've said that I might jinx it for one of the upcoming months uh, the rest of this year, but who knows. Uh, maybe I'll be, be lucky and have at least 24 Spotlight albums to choose from for my end-of-year best list. I, I like to do a uh, favorite Backtrack Spotlight albums list along with my favorite new release albums at the end of the year, so instead of just a top five this year, maybe I'll actually have a top ten, so who knows, we'll see. So without further ado, and with no more delays either, let's get on into the list and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of July 2019. Happy 60th birthday to Bo Diddley's second release and his first studio album, Go Bo Diddley. His self-titled first release was a collection of singles. Rolling Stone ranked this album at number 214 on their list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. Two tracks, You Don't Love Me, You Don't Care, and Little Girl, were recorded during Bo's first recording session for Chess Records four years earlier. The single I'm Sorry reached number 17 on the Billboard R&B Singles Chart, and Say Man crossed over to the Billboard Hot 100, where it peaked at number 20. Among the album's session players were the legendary bluesman Willie Dixon on bass, and female rock guitar pioneer Peggy Jones, who later became known as the Queen Mother of Guitar. Also released in July of 1959 was Billie Holiday's final album, which upon her death was given the title Last Recording. Arranged by Ray Ellis, it was recorded four months before her death and released the very month she died. Unfortunately, her declining health had caused her voice to deteriorate, and so the album is generally not regarded as one of her better efforts. Tracks on the album include the Rodgers and Hart tune You Took Advantage of Me, the classic standard All of Me by Sammy Kahn and Jimmy Van Heusen, When It's Sleepy Time Down South, and Deed I Do. Fifty-five years ago this month, the Beach Boys released All Summer Long, their sixth album. It spent 49 weeks on the Billboard Albums chart, peaking at number four. It was notable for being the last of their albums to be dominated by themes of beach and hot rod culture. Little Honda references a motorcycle, not a car, and the only song to actually mention surfing is Don't Back Down. The album's lead-off single was the smash hit I Get Around, which became the band's first number one chart hit. Also featured is their cover of Hushabye, originally by the Mystics, and Girls on the Beach, which they were seen performing in the movie by the same name. July of 1964 also saw the release of Ella Fitzgerald's album, Hello Dolly. Arranged and conducted by Frank Duvall, it featured popular jazz hits and show tunes of the era, including People from the musical Funny Girl, popularized by Barbra Streisand, the title track from the production Hello Dolly, and the Domenico Modugno classic Volare, as well as the jazz standard How High the Moon. The minor hit single generated from the album was Can't Buy Me Love, originally by the Beatles, the only representation of a contemporary pop hit on the album. July of 1969 saw the release of Nick Drake's debut album, Five Leaves Left. July of 1969 saw the release of Nick Drake's debut album, Five Leaves Left. The album's backing band features members of the UK bands Fairport Convention and Pentangle. The album received mixed reviews upon release and failed to chart due to lack of promotion by the label, but it's since become critically acclaimed, appearing on all-time best albums lists from Rolling Stone, Enemy, and Uncut, and is included in the book 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. No singles were released from the album at the time, but Riverman, which Drake recorded as the album's centerpiece, was issued as a single 35 years later in 2004. Also released half a century ago this month was The Doors' fourth album, The Soft Parade. Produced by Paul Rothschild, the album peaked at number six on the Billboard 200, but is generally regarded as one of the band's weaker efforts due to its departure from their signature rock sound. Lead single Touch Me reached number three on the Billboard Hot 100, and subsequent singles Wishful Sinful, Tell All the People, and Run in Blue charted outside the top 40. Happy 45th anniversary this month to Stevie Wonder's 17th album, Fulfilling This First Finale. Frack. Happy 
Happy 45th anniversary this month to Stevie Wonder's 17th album, Fulfillingness First Finale. It was his first album to top the Billboard Pop Albums chart. It held a number one spot for two weeks, and it spent nine weeks at number one on the R&B Albums chart. It won two Grammys, including Album of the Year and Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. The single, Boogie on Reggae Woman, clinched the Grammy for Best Male R&B Vocal Performance. The other single, You Haven't Done Nothing, featured the Jackson 5 on backing vocals. Paul Anka provided backing, backing vocals on Heaven is Ten Zillion Light Years Away. Other supporting players on the album include vocalists Denise Williams and Minnie Riperton, and guitarist Michael Cimbello. Also released in July of 1974 was Eric Clapton's sophomore album, 461 Ocean Boulevard. It topped the album's charts in the U.S. and Canada, peaked at number three in the U.K., and reached the top ten in five other countries. The lead-off single, a cover of Bob Marley's I Shot the Sheriff, became Clapton's only single to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The album's other single, a version of Johnny Otis's Willie and the Hand Jive, reached the top 40. Other tracks include the Willie Dixon tune I Can't Hold Out and the blues standard Motherless Children. Forty years ago this month, Chic released their third album, Risk A. It peaked at number 5 on the Billboard 200 and number 2 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart, and was certified platinum in the U.S. It reached number 29 on the U.K. Albums chart. Lead-off single, Good Times, topped the Billboard Hot 100 and R&B singles charts, and peaked at number 5 in the U.K. Follow-up single, My Forbidden Lover, peaked in the top 40 of the U.S. R&B chart and the U.K. singles chart. My Feet Keep Dancing narrowly missed the top 40 in the U.S. and the top 20 in the U.K. UK publication NME and the French magazine Telerama both cite Risqué as one of the best albums of all time. Blender ranks it at number 36 in their list of the 100 greatest American albums of all time, and it's also featured in the book 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. July of 1979 also saw the release of Highway to Hell, ACDC's sixth album. Produced by Mutt Lang, it was the band's second most successful album behind Back in Black. It peaked at number 17 on the Billboard 200 and number 13 in the band's native Australia. Rolling Stone ranked it at number 200 on their list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. The title track is now a hard rock classic, but at its release it only peaked at number 47 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 56 in the UK. But it was a top 20 single in Belgium and the Netherlands. Other singles include Girls Got Rhythm and Touch Too Much. This was the last ACDC album to feature vocalist Bon Scott, who died the following year. Celebrating its 35th anniversary this month is New Edition's self-titled sophomore album. It peaked at number 6 on the Billboard Pop Albums chart and number 1 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart, and was certified double platinum in the U.S. It was also a number 1 album in Ireland. The first single, Cool It Now, reached number 4 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 7 on the New Zealand Singles chart. The follow-up single, Mr. Telephone Man, written by Ray Parker Jr. of Ghostbusters fame, peaked at number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100 and was a top 20 single in the U.K. and Ireland. Both singles hit number one on the Billboard R&B singles chart. July of 1984 also saw the release of Ride the Lightning, the sophomore album by Metallica. It was originally issued on the independent label Megaforce, but received a reissue by Elektra Records after they signed the band two months later. It peaked at number 100 on the Billboard 200, but by November 1987 it had sold half a million copies and it currently holds a six times platinum certification. It was the last Metallica album to feature songwriting contributions from Dave Mustaine, who would go on to form Megadeth, and was recorded in three weeks in drummer Lars Ulrich's home country of Denmark. Thirty years ago this month, Gloria Estefan released Cuts Both Ways, her fourth English language album, and her final album to give credit to her backing band, The Miami Sound Machine. It hit the top of the album's charts in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and the Netherlands, and peaked at number eight on the Billboard 200. Lead-off single, Don't Wanna Lose You, was a top 10 hit in Canada, the UK, and Ireland, and reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and Billboard Latin singles charts. Subsequent single, Get On Your Feet, went top 20 on the Billboard Hot 100, and in Canada, the Netherlands, and Ireland. Here We Are and the title track topped the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart. The album is certified three times platinum in the US, the UK, and Australia. Also released in July of 1989 was the Beastie Boys sophomore album, Paul's Boutique. It only reached number 14 on the Billboard 200 and didn't crack the top 20 of any international chart or even the Billboard Hip Hop Albums chart, but it has since gone on to legendary status, ranking on the all-time greatest albums lists by music authorities including Blender, Rolling Stone, Time, VH1, and others. It was originally conceived as an instrumental project by the producers, the Dust Brothers, but they were convinced by the Beastie Boys to make their album using those tracks. 
a quarter of a century ago, Hootie and the Blowfish released their debut album, Cracked Rear View. It was the band's most successful album. By the end of 1995, it had sold 10 million copies and was the best-selling album of the year. Currently, it sits among the top 20 all-time top-selling albums in the U.S. It hit number one on the Billboard 200 at least five times, although oddly, I couldn't figure out how many weeks total it spent on the chart. It also hit number one in Canada and New Zealand. The album's first three singles, Hold My Hand, Let Her Cry, and Only Wanna Be With You, all reached the top 10 on the Billboard Hot 100. Let Her Cry reached number two in Canada and number four in Australia. Only Wanna Be With You and the subsequent single, Time, both hit number one in Canada. And as a trivia note here, the album sold three million copies just through the Columbia House Mail Order Music Club, and uh, most likely I was one of those people. Also released in July of 1994 was Marilyn Manson's debut album, Portrait of an American Family. Originally called the Manson Family Album, its release was delayed for seven months while the band faced pushback from the label over references to Charles Manson and his followers and worry over anti-Semitic content, which was unfounded. The closest the album came to charting in the U.S. was reaching number 35 on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart in March of 1995. The album was eventually certified gold by the RIAA in May of 2003. The album contains dialogue snippets from several movies such as Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Last Tango in Paris, Poltergeist 2, and Pink Flamingos. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Destiny's Child's sophomore album, The Writings on the Wall. It peaked at number 5 on the Billboard 200, and in a little over two years it had been certified eight times platinum. Singles Bills, 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 and Say My Name both topped the Billboard Hot 100 chart and reached number 9 in Canada. Jumpin' Jumpin' peaked at number 3 in the US and number 2 in Australia. All four of the album's singles went top ten in the Netherlands. The album earned six Grammy nominations. Singles, Bills, 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 and Say My Name were both nominated for Best R&B Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals and Best R&B Song. Say My Name won both of those Grammys and was also nominated for Record of the Year and Song of the Year. Also released in July of 1999 was Macy Gray's debut album on How Life Is. It peaked at number four on the Billboard 200 and number three on the UK Albums Chart. It hit number one in Australia, Canada, Denmark, and New Zealand, and went top ten in eight other countries. It currently enjoys triple platinum certification in the U.S. Of its four singles, I Try was by far the most successful. Not only did it win a Grammy for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance and earn nominations for Record of the Year and Song of the Year, but it was number one on the charts in Australia, New Zealand, and Ireland, number two in Canada, number five in the U.S., and it went top ten in four other countries. The follow-up single, Still, went top 10 in New Zealand, top 20 in the UK, and narrowly missed the top 20 in Australia. Fifteen years ago this month, Katie Lang released her ninth album, Hymns of the 49th Parallel. It was her first release on the Nonesuch label. It peaked at number 37 on the Billboard 200, number 3 in Australia, and number 2 on the Canadian Albums charts. It consists of covers of songs by some of Lang's favorite Canadian artists, such as After the Gold Rush by Neil Young, Jericho by Joni Mitchell, The Valley by Jane Sibbery, and Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen. And as for the significance of the title, the 49th parallel north of the equator is where most of the border lies between the U.S. and Canada. Also released in July of 2004 was McFly's debut album, Room on the Third Floor. It peaked at number one on the U.K. Albums Chart and made McFly the youngest band since the Beatles to have a number one album in the U.K. It reached number two in Scotland, number 19 in Ireland, and number 26 in Japan. As of 2014, the album has sold 2 million copies worldwide. Its first two singles, Five Colors in Your Hair and Obviously, topped the UK and Scotland singles charts, and later singles, That Girl and the title track, went top five on both charts. I have a real soft spot for these guys. They do, so, do some great, great uh, pop songs, kind of power pop, you know, guitar-driven pop songs. Uh, just give them a try if you haven't yet. I, I intend to do a uh, couple of videos about them. My, favorite songs uh, comes to mind, so give them a try. Turning 10 years old this month, we have Florence and the Machines debut album, Lungs. It was a top 10 album in eight countries. In the UK, it debuted at number two and spent half a year in the top 40 before finally reaching number one. It didn't reach its Billboard 200 peak position of number 14 until September of 2010. It achieved double platinum certification in the US in June of 2018. Its only charting single in the U.S. was Dog Days Are Over at number 21. It, that single reached number 23 in the U.K. Rabbit Heart, Raise It Up, hit number 12 on the U.K. chart, and You've Got the Love peaked at number 5 in the U.K. The album earned Florence and the Machine a Grammy nomination for Best New Artist. 
July of 2009 also saw the release of Ocean Eyes, the sophomore album and first major label release by Owl City. It peaked at number 8 on the Billboard 200, but it topped the Billboard Alternative, Dance Electronic, and Rock Albums charts. It peaked at number 7, coincidentally enough, in Germany, Scotland, South Africa, and the UK. The lead-off single, Fireflies, was a number one hit in US, UK, Australia, Ireland, and the Netherlands, and top five in several other countries. But subsequent singles, Vanilla Twilight and Hello Seattle, only cracked the top 40 in the Netherlands and New Zealand. But the album's success prompted Universal to reissue Owl City's self-release debut on their own label. Five years ago this month, Al, my pal, released Mandatory Fun, his 14th album. It was Weird Al Yankovic's first album to ever reach number one on the Billboard 200, the first comedy album to ever debut at that spot, and the first to reach number one since Alan Sherman's My Son the Nut in 1963. It reached number three in Canada, number nine in Australia, and number 16 in New Zealand. Its win in the Best Comedy Album category gave Al his fourth Grammy Award. Word Crimes, a parody of Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines, was not released as an official single, but nevertheless it peaked at number 39 on the Billboard Hot 100, giving Al his fourth Top 40 song, and making Al the third artist, after Michael Jackson and Madonna, to have a Top 40 single in every decade since the 80s. U2 joined that elite group in 2017. July of 2014 also saw the release of Bleacher's Strange Desire. It was the debut project by artist-songwriter-producer Jack Antonoff of the band Fun. It peaked at number 11 on the Billboard 200, but reached number 2 on the Billboard Alternative and Rock Albums charts. It peaked at number 19 in Canada. The debut single, I Wanna Get Better, topped the Billboard Alternative Songs chart and reached number 21 on the Canadian Rock Singles chart. Subsequent single, Roller Coaster, hit number 3 and number 27 respectively on the same charts. Vince Clark of the band Erasure, Yoko Ono and Grimes all make contributions to the album. Two of the album's tracks, Roller Coaster and Wild Heart, would go on to be featured in the 2018 movie Love, Simon, whose soundtrack was produced by Antonoff. Okay, and now let's head right on into the Spotlight albums. As is usually the case, both of these albums are my first real full album introductions to their respective bands. First of all, let's take a look at The Kinks and their 17th album, Low Budget. This is uh, 40 years old this month, uh, released in 1979. Now, I am, of course, most familiar with The Kinks' uh, 60 singles. I don't have, as I said, I don't have any other full albums by them. I do have a two-disc compilation of their greatest hits. Uh, really enjoy their earlier stuff. I'm kind of wondering, you know, for that reason, I'm kind of surprised I'm not more into The Kinks, because I love their 60 singles so much. And this album, uh, it was actually their best-selling non-compilation album in the U.S., which is a little strange to me uh, once you hear me get into the album. It's very unlike the Kinks 60 stuff, yet it's, it's very unusual. It opens with almost a punk sounding verse on the, the opening track, Attitude. So yeah, it's got, I mean, released at the end of the 70s, it's kind of got some 70s sounds, as you can probably imagine. Uh, let's see, one of the standout tracks is Catch Me Now I'm Falling. That's a really, good, really, really good song, even though what made me think it was familiar was the fact that the guitar riff is very, very similar to the riff in the Rolling Stones' Jumpin' Jack Flash. So that's why I thought I'd heard it before, but I don't think I actually had until... I mean, I probably heard it on their singles uh, compilation, if it's on there. But anyway, yeah, that's, a, that's a good song. Uh, Misery is uh, Misery is kind of like a southern rock sort of thing. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting... Again, something that is, as is the majority of this album, very atypical for the Kinks. Uh, so when you put this album on, don't expect to hear the kinks that you know and love. Be ready for some unusual sounds. Oh, and the, the closing track, Moving Pictures, it reminded me, strange as it may sound, it reminded me of Steely Dan. So it's got a, just a little bit of a jazz sort of inflection to it. Uh, not full-on hitch-over-the-head kind of jazz, but just the little subtle traces of a jazz influence. But yeah, it's this has some, as I said, some punk rock influences with uh, the song Pressure is a really good example of that. And it's also got some new wave sounds, some disco-esque sort of stuff, uh, which, you know, being 1979, is, it, it wouldn't surprise you. Uh, National Health is one of the, the new wave sort of sounding tracks on it. So, yeah, and Wish I Could Fly Like Superman is another fairly well-known song, I believe, in the Kinks discography. But yeah, I, was, I have to admit, when I first put this on, I was rather disappointed because it was a jarring difference, as I said, from the Kinks that I'm more familiar with. But... All in all, it's it's not a bad album. 
and I can I can kind of see why it was it did turn out to be successful in the states was not terribly successful in the UK, which you know kind of goes to, stands to reason with you know the UK loving the Kinks, uh, you know probably they're more traditionalists I would think with the Kinks sound. But anyway, yeah, uh, not a bad album. If all of the Kinks output sounded like this, I would probably be reluctant to uh, to delve into the Kinks more. But you know, knowing how good their '60s stuff was, I'm I will probably eventually pick up some of their uh, older albums. But uh, yeah, not bad at all. Uh, not sorry I picked it up. Of course, I I paid what did I pay four dollars for it, so hey, not a huge loss, right? Uh, the other album I'm going to talk about is uh, the one that was much more interesting to me, and that is the original Delaney and Bonnie. It is by Delaney and Bonnie. It is their sophomore album, uh, and it turns 50 years old this month, released in July of 1969. And this, uh, I did some reading up on it uh, before I actually bought the album, and it described it as a mix of soul and blues and country and rock and even a little bit of gospel. Not so much the lyrical content of gospel as the musical feel of gospel, which, which I love. Uh, and, and it definitely was all those things rolled into one. And you know how much I like albums that don't fit into you know, one or two specific genres that just cannot really be classified. That's this stuff. Uh, one of the standout tracks on here is When the Battle is Over, and that was actually co-written by Dr. John Magrebinek. Uh, there's, uh, they do a cover of the Aretha Franklin classic Do Right Woman, Do Right Man, and it's fantastic, gorgeous. And uh, yeah, as I said on several of the tracks, there's some uh, gospel-tinged piano on there, and so, but yeah, I mean, just all sorts of sounds on this album. If you like, kind of, soul and blues are the main overriding genres that you'll hear on this album but as i said there's a mixes of you know just little dashes of rock and country and pop and gospel uh pick this album G give it a listen at least um and this is actually compelling me to pick up their first album and to see what uh what i haven't heard from them uh so far see if it's it's as good as this and actually, the, the supporting players on this album were uh, very noteworthy. Uh, Bobby Whitlock, who actually played on uh, Derek and the Dominoes. Uh, so he was associated with Eric Clapton, of course. And actually, Clapton really enjoyed this album. He spoke very highly of this album. Uh, it's one of his favorites. And uh, Jim Keltner, who's a very popular uh, session player, uh, drums, I believe. I believe he's a drummer. And then uh, Leon Russell and Rita Coolidge support this album. I mean, the, the stars, I and mean, this is almost an all-star album, really. But yeah, Delaney and Bonnie Bramlett. Uh, I think Bonnie, they divorced, they were married this time. They divorced in, I think, 73, if I remember correctly. And Bonnie Bramlett has released more solo stuff since then than, than Delaney did. Uh, Delaney died in 1990, I believe. But uh, but yeah, anyway, enough of the backstory. This is a great album. I, I love this album very, very much. Uh, so yeah, one of my more favorite uh, backtrack spotlights for the year. Yeah, the original Delaney and Bonnie. Give it, a, give it a try. So yeah, those were my Spotlight albums. Another two very good choices. I I don't think I've had any real duds when it comes to Spotlight albums. I'm pretty darn lucky. So yeah, that wraps up Backtracks for July of 2019. And that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I appreciate feedback, whether about this video or anything on my channel, or about music in general. I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. I invite you to subscribe to my channel as well if you haven't yet, and check out my past videos to see what you might have missed. I'm also on Twitter, and you can find the link to my Twitter feed in the description below, so check it out and follow along. Also, please take the time to visit my friends and fellow YouTubers channels, which are also linked to in the description below. They're all great at what they do, and they're very much worth your attention. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be music snob.